Hi, everybody. I'm going to move some furniture around up here so I have a place to put my water. <laughs> to get together and um, we don't often have a chance to sit around and read the poems of others out loud. We have a lot of poetry readings where poets read our own poems um, so it's pretty special to have been invited to really dwell deeply inside some ancient and modern poems and find the ones that spoke to you the most and then practice reading them out loud which I hadn't done with other people's poetry since grad school. Um, and try and find the feelings in them so that I can feel the feelings in them in my body and bring them to you. So it's a great honor to be asked to do that um, and be in conversation with these poems. And one of the things that I love the most about this book is what Murray was talking about, that the poems in conversation with one another. Um, and the poems that I've chosen are mostly poems in which one poet um, responds to the work of another, which I think is very relieving and very relaxing. There are things that we can't figure out how to say. Um, we can turn to the history of literature and someone has tried to say it probably lots of different times in lots of different ways. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, the late, great Audrey and Rich, um, our <coughs> lesbian feminist foremother, um, great moral, ethical, political poet of the 20th century, um, who, uh, on her deathbed in um, 2012, uh, responded to the shooting of Trayvon Martin by asking her hospice nurse, who was my friend, to go get her a hoodie and a can of tea and a bag of skills. We took one of her last pictures like that um, as she was dying. So um, Audrey and Rich, her poem, What Kinds, what kinds of Times Are These? opens up this anthology, and as Murray said, it's in response to a poem by Bertolt Brecht, written in 1939, um, the height of terror in Europe. Um, Bertolt Brecht writes, what times are these in which a conversation about trees is almost a crime? For in doing so, we maintain our silence about so much wrongdoing. Audrey and Rich in 1991. What kind of times are these? There's a place between two stands of trees where the grass grows uphill, and the old revolutionary road breaks off into shadows, near a meeting house abandoned by the persecuted, who dispersed into these shadows. I walk there picking mushrooms at the edge of dread, but don't be fooled, this isn't a Russian poem. This isn't somewhere else, but here. Our country moving closer to its own truth and dread, its own ways of making people disappear. I won't tell you where the place is, the dark mesh of the woods meeting the unmarked strip of light, ghost-ridden crossroads, leaf mold paradise. I already know who wants to buy it, sell it, make it disappear. And I won't tell you where it is, so why do I tell you anything? Because you still listen. Because in times like these, to have you listen at all, it's necessary to talk about trees. Not too much. I think there's so much nuance in that last line. It's to have you listen at all, it's necessary to talk about trees. It's both there's both frustration in it, like to have to be able to look at these terrible things, we also have to look at something beautiful, or I have to give you something distracting and beautiful to look at to get you here. But it's also like to talk about, in times like these, we must look at trees to maintain our survival. So there's there's the, that duality in this poem, which I love. Um, and the next poem I want to read is in conversation with a newspaper article. Um, and this is a tiny little poem. Um, called April 14th, 2017, Reading the News, um, by a contemporary woman named Ellery Akers. Um, and she responds to an article, uh, the headline of which is, Trump's EPA chief, Scott Pruitt, calls for an exit to the Paris Climate Agreement. 
This morning I see that 100 men in suits are willing to throw away the world so they can have more small green rectangles made from trees. It's spring. Plum blossoms speckle the sidewalk and fall on my shoes, flake after flake. But I can't forget these men chopping away on the other side of my life. I keep reminding myself I don't know how it's going to end. Attila scorched and divided, but the grass from those burnt blades grew over him. Um, the next set of conversation poems I want to read is between the Chinese Tang Dynasty poet um, Po Chu Yi, who lived from 772 to 846, and some of his time he lived in exile. Um, and at the end of his life, he became a hermit uh, in the mountains and completed his work of poetry. I think it's a career choice that should come back to fashion. <laughs> uh, and uh, that poem is in dialogue, uh, well, the next poem is by W.S. Merwin is in dialogue with Po Chu Yi. Um, Merwin died this year in 1991, I mean, 19, at the age of 91, he died this year at the age of 91, um, and was great friends with Audrey and Rich. So Po Chui's poem is translated by David Hinton. On setting a migrant group goose free. Snow's heavy at Hassan Yang this 10th year winter. River water spawns ice, tree branches break and fall, and hungry birds flock east and west by the hundred. A migrant goose crying starvation loudest among them. Pecking through snows the grass, Sleeping nights on ice, its cold wings lumber slower and slower up into flight. And soon it's tangled in a river boy's net, carried away snug in his arms, and put for sale in the market. Once a man of the north, I'm accused and exiled here. <coughs> man and bird, though different, we're both visitors. And it hurts a visiting man to see a visiting bird's pain. So I pay the ransom and set you free. <laughs> goose, oh soaring goose, rising into clouds, where will you fly now? Don't fly northwest, that's the last place you should go. There in Huasi, rebels still loose, there's no peace. Just a million armored soldiers long massed for battle, imperial and rebel armies grown old facing each other. Starved and exhausted, they'd love to get a hold of you, those soldiers. They'd shoot you down and have a feast, then pluck your wings clean to feather their arrows. And Merwin writes, a message to Po Chu Yi. In that tenth winter of your exile, the cold never letting go of you, and your hunger aching inside you day and night, while you heard the voices out of the starving mouths around you, old ones and infants and animals, those curtains of bones swaying on stilts, and you heard the faint cries of the birds searching in the frozen mud for something to swallow, and you watched the migrants trapped in the cold, the great geese growing weaker by the day until their wings could barely lift them above the ground, so that a gang of boys could catch one in a net and drag him to market to be cooked. And it was then that you saw him in his own exile, and you paid for him and kept him until he could fly again, and you let him go. But then where could he go in the world of your time with its wars everywhere? And the soldiers hungry, the fires lit, the knives out 1,200 years ago. I have been wanting to let you know the goose is well. <laughs> he is here with me. <laughs> you would recognize the old migrant. He has been with me for a long time and is in no hurry to leave here. The wars are bigger now than ever. Greed has reached numbers that you would not believe. And I will not tell you what is done to geese before they kill them. Now we are melting the very poles of the earth, but I have never known where he would go after he Um, the next one I want to read is about race in America, and it's in the section that Murray is reading from. Um, and it's a conversation 
poem, the tw uh, it's a conversation poem. Evie Shockley wrote a poem called Ode to My Blackness. And Sharon Olds wrote a poem in response called Ode to My Whiteness. Um, and I'm going to read this Sharon Olds poem. Um, and in part, I'm going to read it uh, because um, to acknowledge the fact that when we talk about race, most white Americans do not acknowledge that whiteness is exist is a thing, and in fact is the thing at the very core of how power in our society is structured and every move we make. Um, so it's the core of the social norms by which we determine who is right and who is wrong, who lives and who dies, um, who gets to keep their children in a CPS investigation and who doesn't. Um, it, until we start seeing it, we cannot uh, change it. And the Contemporary writer Jean Alo just put out a challenge on Twitter to white Americans saying, asking, um, what do you want whiteness to be? Um, which I think is a great question for us. Um, extraordinary question. But we can't change it if we can't name it. Here's Sharon Olds trying to name it. Ode to my whiteness after D.B. Shockley. You were invisible to me. You went without thinking. You were my weapon secret from myself. Whatever I got, you helped get it for me. You were my ignorance. Because of you, I was not innocent. I did not see that. You were my blinding light. My dreams had a blank area in the center, taking up most of the screen they played on in my sleep. A blazing circle that blanked out the core of the scene. I thought it was my mother's violence. But it was you, too. You, the unseen fat which fed me in the wilderness. You, my Masonic handshake. You, my stealth. You, my drone. You, my collaborator. You, my magician's cloak of steam. You, my dissembler. You, mine. I, yours. Irisless eyeball. You, my blindness. The inspiration of my helpless act. You, my silence. Evie's blackness, a dancer. You, another. The two of you moving together. Sharon Holmes. Um, and next I want to read a poem of my own. Mary was kind enough to invite us to bring one, one poem from our <coughs> work. Um, and this one came to me to read. Uh, it's a prose poem, and it came to me to read because it's about it has the theme of buying an animal with the intention of setting it free, um, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Um, it's called Attraction. My mother climbs downstairs to the cave without a name and sings by baby bunting. My songs, when I try to sing like her, smell of moss and her hair and green baby snakes wriggling through an underground creek. I hold my hands in the air and she encourages me to live. She blows on wood and it breaks into pencils. She uses spider webs like clothesline to hang her extra hours on and she never runs out of tools. I hold my mother's hand while she falls asleep and dream animals start to stream from the gorge in her heart. Her bent, crooked hands and her river of white hair leave me speechless. She's escaped my father's iron fist, finally. Dreams, if written down, will attract their sequels. Dreams are hungry to be written and angry if ignored. And she teaches me that a dream will draw my maps. When I survive a drunken driver, a rollover car crash, and a highway fire, my mother drives from Louisiana to California. We slowly walk a block to the fish market. She points at a bubbling tank and chooses two green long-legged frogs. Let's buy them and set them free, she says. We'll go to the lake, lake and have a ceremony of gratitude. I'd like these two, she says, and pays $10. Then we hear the cleaver, the <laughs> rustle of paper wrapping. She deflates. I'll eat them. I must eat them, she says, so their deaths are of use. Dreams, if written down, attract their sequels. Life has the wonderful scent of blood. It attracts more jumping, hungry bodies. Deaths, if not honored fully, attract more deaths. What can we do? 100 million pairs of frog legs are eaten every year. She sways over my cast iron skillet 
and I hold her hand as she carefully, sadly chews and extracts the tiny bones with her teeth. And the last poem that I want to read, um, I find it utterly delightful. Um, it's called Why Humans? And I feel like, I, I mean, I'm sometimes wondering these days, what are humans good for? <laughs> why, why are we here? When will we be done here? Um, and let the earth prepare herself, shouldn't we go? Um, and so this poem by Meryl Natchez asks, why humans? And I really love her answers. Why humans? For the joke. <laughs> Even the pun. <laughs> for black humor in a bleak hour. For the complications of stuff. Tangled, woven, manufactured, compressed. Crooked, cooked, plastic and rubber and corian. Concrete, steel and asphalt. For glass blown from sand and fire. For grammar. For the 6,500 spoken languages for minch and derriere and giggle and preposterous. For the winch, the pulley, the level, the wheel. For faucets that turn on when you wave your hand. <laughs> for hands with their cunning thumbs. For false teeth, false testimony, avarice, compassion. For the known step of the beloved on the stairs. Eyebrow and gap tooth, elfin ear, for arrival, for departure, the longing for return, for the embrace, the howl, the song, for the brief spark in the spiraling dark. Thank you.